All right, let's get going. Um, for those that weren't in my uh, earlier talk today, uh, I am Michiel, hello. Um, I'm a developer, a consultant, a trainer, and obviously a speaker. Uh, my Twitter handle right there, if you want to reach out to me, um, a complaint about the talk, um, or uh, view the slides. I'll post the slides online uh, after the talk. Uh, I work for a company called Four Scouts. We do a, a lot of consulting on continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So if you have questions, if we can help you, please uh, come see me after the talk and we'll exchange details. All right, let's get going. As I said, this is a project that took about a year and a half. Um, this project um, happened in Amsterdam uh, along a beautiful river called the Eye River. Um, the company this occurred at is uh, called the Pers Group Employment Solutions, which is part of the Pers Group, which is a large uh, newspaper company in, the Bel in Belgium and the Netherlands. They own a number of large uh, newspapers, uh, but also a bunch of online um, companies, such as this one. They have three online job boards, three Dutch online job boards. Uh, and, uh, IT job board and two other job boards. Um, this company was dealing, they existed for a bunch of years, and uh, they were dealing with uh, essentially uh, an aging system, an aging um, application, a large and aging monolith, uh, which happened to generate a bunch of income, uh, serious money every year. But it was also dreadfully slow and very complex. Um, dreadfully slow, uh, page load times of five to six seconds, or worse, were not uncommon. Um, technical debt was also a serious issue in this project. Um, and this, when we look at the architecture of this large aging monolith, um, there are a few things that, that, uh, that pop up. On the top, we have three job sites that I told you about. The traffic from uh, the internet to one of these three job sites essentially came and comes into the same set of load balancers and varnish caches. Um, the, that traffic then gets distributed uh, across a bunch of front-end servers which handle the load. Um, they talk to a bunch of back-end servers. So far, so good, right? Um, problem being there that some front-end servers talk to other front-end servers, and some back-end servers talk to other back-end servers by about three different ways, uh, RPC, direct database access, and REST APIs. Um, plus, the only way to distinguish a front-end server from a back-end server is a simple flag. They run the exact same code, or the exact same code is on that machine. The only way to distinguish is a Boolean, essentially. And so, in the, in the bottom of the picture, they connect to a bunch of external services and Solar and what have you, MySQL. So this is the picture um, as we found it, essentially, as a number of external consultants, of which I was one, and we were uh, asked to help the uh, existing team, about 16 people. And that existing team were dealing uh, with this monolith uh, by manual releases. Every four to five weeks, usually on the weekend. And the problem with a job site is that it has two groups of consumers, two groups of customers, essentially. One group is the group of recruiters and uh, employers that post jobs on a job site. They tend to do that on weekdays from 9 to 5. And the other group, those are the actual consumers, if you will, they're looking for a job or maybe for a better job. And they tend to do that at night on weekdays or in the weekend. So you can imagine that if you take the site down for a manual release every weekend or every uh, four to five weeks a uh, weekend, that hurts the people that use the site to find a job. Of course, it doesn't hurt the people paying the bills, but it does hurt the people uh, that make your site popular or unpopular. So anyway, manual releases every four to five weeks, usually a lot of firefighting in the week after the release. Fragile tests, uh, tests that would randomly fall over uh, would randomly fail, and then the next test run would work again, uh, only to have another test fail. Uh, so something that you can't really trust, and oh, they ran for about two or three hours in some cases. Like I said, frequent firefighting after releases, but in general between releases as well. A lot of issues that took uh, valuable development time from the team. 
And the team was getting pretty frustrated, uh, and all this had, had a, sig a result in a significantly lower velocity than you would expect with such a team. Now, there are a few things that you can ask um, um, when all this is happening, and of course management was asking uh, a few things as well, and they set a few goals down to, to improve this. One of the goals, uh, to obviously reduce the number of issues that this team was dealing with. Because, um, again, that takes away valuable development time. The other goal, the next goal, is to reduce the lead time. And by lead time, I mean the time it takes for an idea to make it all the way into production, usable by a consumer. Um, before we started with this transition, the lead time was measured in number of months, three to four months easily. Uh, which in a highly competitive market such as the online job boards, uh, at this point is simply not acceptable anymore. So that needs to be reduced by a fair amount. Third, increase the productivity of, uh, of the team. Goes hand in hand with goal number one. If we reduce the number of issues that the team needs to work on, then obviously they can spend their time on doing more useful things. Fourth, increase the motivation. This may even be one of the most important goals, because if you have a team that is frustrated, that is not uh, performing to the level what they think, um, then at some point they may go away to another company. Um, and you want to make sure that developer retention is actually a thing. Um, not only developers, but also testers and everybody pretty much involved with the development of this application. So they need to become more motivated uh, to handle this and to keep them uh, essentially, or to increase the chances of keeping them at the company. Now, um, I stipulated these four goals, and these goals lead to a, a very uh, simple question. How? Now, how translates into should we refactor or should we rebuild? Let me explain those two things. Refactoring uh, means that we um, iteratively start improving uh, small parts of the code, and then if we do that long enough, then small parts become large parts, and we have the application under control again. Uh, they started enthusiastically with that. After three, four months, uh, we have about 2.5% code coverage, um, which is not a, a lot, but in absolute terms, or actually in relative terms, it's an insane jump from, it was about 0 0.5, but still, that's not going to cut it. Um, a rebuild, by a re with a rebuild, I consider a something called a cut over rewrite. And a cut over rewrite is essentially we build, we have system A on the, uh, at first, and we build system B next to it up to the same uh, feature level essentially as system A. And at some point we're, we're done, we have reached the exact same functionality as system A, and then we switch over. Now, the a big flipping switch or flipping the big switch, that has never uh, gone wrong, right? Um, plus, if you do something like that, you tend to rebuild all of the problems or rewrite all of the problems that are in the original system. Um, this system has been developed over the course of 10 to 15 years. Most, if not all, of the decisions that have been made in the 10 to 15 years are gone. Or at least the why is gone. The persons behind those decisions have long left the company. Things were not documented. Uh, bugs have actually become features. Uh, we don't know uh, why certain things were put in there. The, the original uh, client or customer that stipulated that feature has already gone. So you end up rebuilding a lot of cruft that you may not even need. So rebuilding is out of the question. Briefly, a commercial off-the-shelf system was considered. Um, there are a few vendors where you can buy a job board, essentially, and we can change a logo and a font and stuff like that. Uh, problem is, this is a company which is an online job board, three actually. So if they buy a commercial off-the-shelf product, they lose their ability to innovate and essentially stop being a company. So that was uh, very briefly considered. Now, if all those things, the answer to all these questions is no, then what is the actual answer? Well, one of the answers is we need to start looking at our APIs as if they are the most important thing. Uh, eat your own dog food, as some people say. Um, the APIs we use in this system uh, are used by external suppliers, such as employers or recruiters, to inject 
uh, jobs into the system and also to search for jobs or for candidates. If we don't consider those APIs to be any important, uh, read, we need to use the same APIs internally that we uh, publish externally, then they're never going to be up to the quality that we should want. We also said we're going to a service-oriented architecture and we're going to uh, introduce services per domain object, which roughly translate to jobs, job seekers, maybe companies, uh, uh, um, terms like that. And we also said that this being a website, we can migrate individual pages, individual web pages from site A to site B or application A to application B. And this is some of the technology we used as part of the whole new stack. Now, when I say migrating individual pages, what do I actually mean? Well, I mean something called the Strangler pattern or the Strangler application. This was coined a few years ago, a bunch of years ago, by a guy named Martin Fowler. Uh, and he said, uh, there's, a, there's a, sort of a tree, or there are more trees but, and plants that grow on other trees or other plants on the outside. And they essentially live off or grow off of the uh, energy of that plant, the host. And they grow and grow until they envelop the host plant, at which point it withers and dies. It's a little bit morbid, but... Uh, translated to uh, our system, our large aging monolith, we can do pretty much the same. Right now in the picture, we have a simple monolithic application connecting it to a database and serving traffic to and from the internet. So far, so good. We then add a proxy in between the internet and the application. Initially, the proxy doesn't do anything. It just passes the traffic through. But then we start adding a service, small service with a little bit of functionality. Maybe it has its own, its own database, maybe not. And that functionality is then implemented in a service, and we can add a rule to the proxy, saying that if uh, a user comes to this page, serve it off of the service, the new service, not the old application. And we can do that for people on our own network, for example, so that people in the company get to see that new page first. And then we open up to about 10% of live traffic, and then 50, and then 100, right? And then we start adding more services and more services with their own databases and own storage and, and whatnot. We add more rules to the proxy. We add more functionality in those services until at some point we're at a level where we say, okay, this is good enough. We've reached what we want to reach in terms of features, in terms of functionality, and the original monolithic application is not doing anything useful anymore, at which point it can be switched off and thrown away. Strangler pattern. That leads to the following architecture. All our front ends are services as well. They are no better or no worse than other services. They are treated the same way. Also means that we now, this company, remember, had three different sites, three labels. We have now have three front-end services, which we can innovate individually. We can do more in terms of the brand. We don't have to make sure that that code is compatible. We can do things for one front-end that we don't want to do for another front-end. Next. All services are behind load balancers. That means that we can scale up and scale down depending on traffic load, depending on the time of day. It also means that we can replace services or replicas of services behind the load balancer by a new version without users noticing it. Zero downtime deployments, very important. Third, we need to access legacy databases in some cases, if only to fix the broken data model, clean it up. And last but not least, we said that every single service has its own container, Docker container. Um, when we started this, this was September 2014. Docker was, um, I think, at 0 .6, 0 0.6, 0.6. Um, but we did start using it in production. So services in containers. Now, after this architecture and the way of ap applying the strangler pattern and, and those things, let's take a look at some of the process changes uh, we agreed on as a group of external consultants with the team. So we didn't decide for the team, we decided with the team. Very important key uh, thing. One of those decisions is that everything happens continuously from now on. That means there are no longer uh, projects don't exist anymore. A project has a start date and, well, hopefully an end date. Um, 
when you do continuous life cycle uh, management, continuous product management, there really is no end until a product is no longer useful on the market and the product is taken out of the market. But there are no projects anymore. There is a, a, an iteration on a daily basis to improve a product and improve a team, improve a company. Right? So everything happens on a continuous basis. And continuous is going to come back during this talk for a few times. One of them is continuous deployment, name of this talk. What is CD though? There are a few uh, differing opinions or differing statements on what CD is. Uh, and I'll show you or I'll tell you what I think CD should be. It all starts with continuous integration. Now, continuous integration is an older term. Um, and continuous integration basically says we have a developer on a machine and they uh, check in some code at some point to GitHub or whatever. And when that, when that check-in occurs, a process on some other server, a build server, starts running, checks out the code, and starts building and testing it. Now, building, that depends on the language you're in. With PHP, you don't, we don't have a compiler, obviously. Um, but you can do other things, like uh, packaging CSS and JS and uh, files together, what have you. Running tests, very important part of this process. So essentially, all these steps um, are to verify that the commit you just made is OK. Once that's all done, CI says that you should have a single uniquely identifying artifact, and that's it. And that artifact can be a tar.gz file. It can be a, a Docker image. It can be anything, really, as long as it's a single thing, which is uh, uniquely identifiable and uniquely tied to that single commit. But that's where it stops. Continuous integration doesn't do anything beyond that point. It verifies the build, and it notifies you uh, uh, whether it's OK or not. Continuous delivery, however, takes that artifact that we just built in the continuous integration step and automatically deploys it to an acceptance environment. And the acceptance environment is where we have our testers and product owners, and they can actually look at the thing, click through our application, and verify that the change that was made is OK. The deployment to acceptance should be completely automated. There should be no human involvement there. Notice the red arrow, however. The red arrow says that if we want to deploy to production, that is a human trigger. So somebody is actually going to press a button somewhere. Right? The only thing is that the deploy to production should be automated like the deploy to acceptance. The only thing is that the human is going to trigger it. Now, if we've done that a couple hundred, couple thousand of times, um, there really is no point for having a human involvement anymore, at which point we start calling it continuous deployment. The red arrow turns green, indicating that we have an automated process that's, that does this. So we still deploy to acceptance, even though I tend to call it staging or pre-production at this point, because, well, other than automated checks, there is no human doing accepting anymore. There's no uh, UAT stage, if you will. So if the deployment to staging or acceptance works, if it deploys successfully and it checks out, then we immediately and irrevocably deploy to production. In my view, Something like this, we call a pipeline, should finish in maybe 15 minutes. From the very commit to GitHub to the last deploy to production. Why would we uh, want to have so something so speedy in order to be able to trust it? If you have a pipeline which takes three hours to deploy to production, or three hours to run the tests, even worse, if, you f uh, if a test fails, you see that maybe in three hours' time, at which point you have already done so much work, which probably, which may even uh, uh, have fixed the test or broken another test. And you need very fast feedback. Now, continuous deployment um, is something that essentially uh, gets the human out of the equation. It means, or at least out of the pipeline, it means that every commit goes into production if we do it well. Every single commit goes into production. Why would we do this? Well, somebody, somebody wise once said, if it hurts, do it more often. 
And then it hurts a lot less because you learn to deal with it. Translating that to deployments, um, companies that are risk averse paradoxically choose to deploy very infrequently and thereby only increasing the risk. So risk averse companies state that we deploy once or twice per year, at which point I can guarantee you that that once or twice a year deployment will fail because there's so much work in there, there's so much pressure to have it work that your twice deployment per year is going to turn into three or four deploys per year. And you have two hot fix deployments after the actual scheduled deployment. So if it hurts, do it more often. Make it small. Make small steps. Small steps means there's less that can go wrong. A lot of small steps. Small steps lead to early feedback. If your pipeline is fast, if your pipeline uh, gives you results in 15 minutes, your commit is deployed into production in 15 minutes, you have very early feedback, very fast feedback of whether your commit changed something for the worse or for the better. Did my metrics go up or down? Is my conversion rate going up or down? You know that very quickly, rather than packaging all these commits in one single deploy every four or five weeks, and you don't know which commit was responsible for what anymore. Third, small steps allow you to reduce the time to recover significantly. If only, if your last commit breaks the production or maybe the pipeline, then a simple git revert head commit, 10 minutes later, you're golden again. It drastically reduces the time to recover. Plus, if you, don't ha if you release every four to five weeks, then those hundreds of commits, they all could have led to the broken state. Right? If you have small steps, it's only the last, maybe the last two commits that it could have caused it. So the amount of um, buck hunting or, or firefighting that you have to do drastically reduces. And by drastically, I mean over 2,000 times. And experiments. Experiments is a very overlooked but very key in ingredient of continuous deployment. If you have a fast pipeline and you have early feedback, it allows you to do small and simple experiments on your product. Take Netflix, for example. Netflix can uh, change the color of the background of, you, of each movie that you see, just to see whether you are more prone to click it. Right? And they have that stuff in production in a few minutes, and then an hour later, they know whether that uh, premise, that hy hypothesis, that theory that they thought up actually works. If it doesn't, we pull it right back. So we can experiment on a, on a grand scale. And sure, most of us don't have the traffic levels that Netflix does, so maybe we need to keep it in production for a day or a week, but the same principle applies. Experimentation. Experimentation, small steps, reducing time to recover, Continuous integration all mean one thing to me, and that is that we can only commit to master or trunk, whatever you call it in your versioning system. And yes, that does mean no branches, ever. Pitchforks. <laughs> this is generally what happens when I, I talk about branches, and I feel very strongly about them, as you uh, could, could, could judge. Um, one of them is this. Has anybody ever had merge hell? No, sure you didn't. Eh? Branches are cheap. Yeah, uh, back in the subversion or maybe even CVS days, uh, um, branches were insane. Uh, especially in early subversion days, uh, a merge would, would kill you. Right? There was no merge info, everything would break, your complete repository would be bonkers, so nobody was trying to do branches. And now in the Git days, and Mercurial and all those other tools, branches are cheap, it's easy. Plus, they even advocated it. Um, but to me, branches have one, uh, when we use them in the context of feature branches, have one distinct flaw. We are abusing our version control system for functional separation. And let me explain what I mean with that. Functional separation. A deployment is a technical exercise. Releasing isn't. With feature branches, we tend to combine the two. Which means that we cannot actually deploy until that feature branch is merged or until the feature is done. Which means we're blocking other people's work. 
which means we're not moving as fast as we can or maybe as we should. Uh, our quality is low. Eh. Delaying integration is a very big thing. I talked about CI. CI only works if you do it regularly. And yes, you can, you can run your tests on your branch, but that's not continuous integration. You're not integrating with anybody. You're on, in your own little isolated world. And you're not actually testing whether your changes coexist peacefully with the changes of your team members. Maybe you can get around merge conflict by continuously merging master up into your branch. Oh, and you probably also want to merge all the other feature branches that are alive into your branch just to see whether that would still work. And on a team of 16 people, that starts to uh, not scale. Um, but then you have fixed your merge conflict. But have you actually checked whether the functionality merges? Whether your, the two features that people built on two branches actually coexist on a functional level? Conflicts, merge conflicts, feature conflicts. Um, something I would definitely recommend against. Now, if, I, uh, if you hear me say, OK, uh, functional separation, deployment is a technical exercise, all well and good. But what if we, don't, what if we can't use feature branches? And what can we use, Michiel? Feature toggles. Feature toggles are what, you are allow, what allow you to deploy even though you are still not ready with a feature. A feature toggle is essentially an if statement, glorified if statement, if you will. The feature toggle decouples the deployment from a release. And it does that by, on the left-hand side, we have a search screen, and on the right-hand side, we have another search screen. One on the left is old, the one on the right is new. Let me tell you, this search screen took more than a couple of days to build. And while we are, we're building it, we're not going to hold back with deploying other stuff, because there are other people working on other features. No, not the whole team is working on that single search page. That wouldn't scale. So we need some way of hiding this functionality from the outside world. And the feature toggle is where it comes in. Feature toggle, usually only on the UI side of things, because if you add a new API endpoint that nobody's going to call, then why hide it behind the feature toggle? The not people not calling it is its own feature toggle, but on the UI, UI side, we did this. The feature toggle is essentially an A-B test for, for Gratis. It um, basically says that when the feature toggle is on, we show the new version. If it's off, we show the old version. And the on part, we can, we can decide based on IP address. Uh, people can set a cookie to, invoke the to enable the feature toggle. All those things. Feature toggle debt is a real thing, though. Um, if feature toggles stay around for too long, and um, you cannot convince the product owner that the uh, feature should be put live, um, and you end up building more and more feature toggles, then you have a combinatorial explosion on your hands, potentially. So. Um, during this project, we not always successfully, but we try to keep a tab, a lid, on the number of feature toggles by either well, forcing, coercing the product owner to go live with a feature or pull everything back. I mean, if we're not going to put it live in two months and it's obviously ready, then there's something else going on. And this is debt that we then need to take back. So we'll remove the feature toggle and the code behind it. But it's something that you need to be aware of. Now, uh, I've been talking about feature branches and, and branches in general. Um, who here does code reviews using pull requests? Yeah, that's about what I would expect, more than half of the audience. Now, pull requests are, are fine in principle. If, and to me only if, the pull request is reviewed in time. And what does in time mean? Uh, within the same day as it is delivered, essentially. Within a few hours, max. Um, why? Because if you wait longer, then it tends to turn into a long-lived feature branch on its own. And we're back to where we started. We're back to square one. We get merge conflicts again, we get other things. Pull requests on their own are fine. Again, if you deal with it fast enough. The problem with a pull request is that by their very nature, you could end up pulling someone out of their flow. 
They're working hard and a pull request is made and then somebody needs to be reviewing that pull request, even though they may have been doing something very important, very critical at that point. Now, there are a few ways around that, but in general, um, I think there are better ways. And this is the better way. <laughs> okay, maybe not like this. Maybe not like this, but pair programming is essential. Pair programming leads to continuous, there it is again, inline code review. Rather than having someone develop and then someone at a later point in time review it, we put the two people together and let them work on the feature together. That way you get an immediate transfer of knowledge, especially if you mix people with more experience and less experience. Uh, or if you mix people that have, uh, that have knowledge of a certain system with people that don't yet. Uh, ops people with dev people. Very, you get very interesting results. And you can have autom automatic 4i principle for those that are concerned with that. It leads to significantly higher quality code. It's not fail-safe, nothing ever is, but it definitely is better than putting people solo behind their monitor and then having to review after. Another thing, the Boy Scout rule. Who is not familiar with the Boy Scout rule? Good. The Boy Scout rule basically says, if you uh, get to a campsite, leave the campsite in a better state than you found it. Translating to that to code, if we see something that's small enough and easy enough to fix, and by small enough, I, I mean in the next 30 minutes or 60 minutes, then do it. There's no need to ask for permission. There's no need to create a story or a ticket. It's just part of your daily work. If you don't, you could end up with the broken window syndrome. One window broken that isn't attended leads to another, leads to another, at which point people stop, stop giving uh, and you have the broken window syndrome. Um, this leads to messy code, leads to a, a, an application that nobody really cares about anymore. Boy Scout rule. Boy Scout rule leads to quality gates. Quality gates that are soft, meaning they don't kill the build or fail the build if we exceed them, and hard gates. Soft gates, you can think of uh, technical debt indicators, duplication indicators, uh, thing, other metrics that a tool such as Sonar would generate, for example. Uh, where you are mostly interested in the trend. Are we getting worse or better? But you're not interested in the actual hard value. One of them, what we are interested in is... Oh, did I make the same typo? <laughs> Oops. 100% code coverage. 100% code coverage is contentious, um, hence the asterisk. Contentious because... Um, 100% code coverage on its own doesn't say anything. What it does trigger a team, whenever they go to 99.9, .9, is have a discussion about whether they should or could ignore some trivial stub code or test code from the code coverage report in order to get to 100%. If you have 80% as a threshold, as long as you're at 80, you're fine. 100% at least allows you to have that discussion every time you bump into 99.9. .9. When it comes to compiled language, I might be a little bit more flexible, because there you have a compiler that helps you um, as an additional safety net. If you remove a method, uh, generally a compiled language, you will get a complaint from the compiler. With uh, uh, interpreted languages such as PHP, you probably generally need a test suite strong enough to catch that for you, or the user will. Another contentious topic, DevOps. Um, we tried to apply DevOps principles from the very early start, and then it was still called, well, it wasn't even called DevOps yet. Uh, at this point, we're starting to add words to it, uh, just because, and we want to cram all those people into a single team. Um, I think this is the most important part. Sure, other people can fit into the team as well. We'll, we'll, we'll accept them and not kick them out. Um, but at least devs and ops need to be together in the same team. Why? A team builds something. And building is easy. Building is easy. Running it, that's where it starts to become challenging. Improving it, oh my, that's where it becomes even more interesting. 
And essentially, the team is responsible for all these things. And you can only be responsible if you're empowered, and you can only be empowered if you have all the ingredients on your team. That means that developers, yes, they get called at night, or could, just as operational people, right? It's the team that gets paged. It's the team that's responsible to keeping an app in production, so the team gets paged when it fails. We don't, we don't uh, at least not in my world, we don't throw things over the wall anymore. Because if you throw things over the wall, it never hurts, right? The pain is, it, is it with the other people, is with the other guys. We don't feel the pain, and if we don't feel the pain, heck, sure, we're, we're not going to improve. We're not feeling the pain. And the only thing that will create, and what it has created over the past decades, is a giant rift between the people maintaining stuff and the people cranking code out like it's, uh, like it's on sale. And keeping those people together, to me, that is the absolute most important key thing to keeping a team responsible and to keeping stuff in production and running successfully. Right. Um, moving on to build pipelines, I talked a little bit about, about pipelines in the context of what does CD now, uh, what does CD mean exactly. Now let's put it all together. A pipeline should automate everything that's repeatable, because if you don't, errors start to occur. Give ten people ten tasks and give the same ten people the next day the same ten tasks. You already see variations. Scripted tasks don't do that. They do the same thing every time as long as there's power. Automate the repeatable things. Less mistakes. Automation is key to CD and to DevOps, by the way. Continuous, there it is again, testing. Very important. Continuous testing builds confidence. Build confidence that we, what we put in production is going to sort of work, usually. Is going to, with a fair amount of confidence, with a fair degree of confidence, we can say, okay, what, what we do now is going to be tested well enough that we can rely on it. I like to think of testing to be um, in depth. And some may disagree with that, but hear me out. Unit tests is where we start our layers of defense. Unit tests where we test simple classes and we mock using prophecy or, or mockery or something like that to, to mock out the entire world around a class to be very controlled about what it sees and what it doesn't, and our tests are very fast. Then we bump up to integration tests where we actually test components rather than individual classes. We may even use concrete data storage, concrete databases with fixture data in there so we know what to expect. We have control over that data. Third step, acceptance tests, is where we actually have um, plain English stories uh, we have acceptance criteria, examples, uh, edge cases written, well, as plain English. Um, and we can convert those using uh, BHAT, for example, into actual runnable code that verifies our system continuously. And we can talk about the functionality without going into implementation details. Last, Selenium, Cypress, um, all the tools that you use to actually do UI tests. Yes, they can be slow, they can be quirky and somewhat fragile, so we probably want to keep a limited set of those. But maybe you flew a few paths through the code, maybe a few critical flows we want to test using something like Selenium. That could lead to something called the testing pyramid. This is just one configuration of the testing pyramid. And at the bottom, we have the unit tests. We have a lot of them because they are cheap and fast, or they should be. Integration tests are slower and more expensive. In general, as we go up the pyramid, our tests become more costly, more expensive, and slower. Note the two little clouds there, exploratory testing and monitoring. Exploratory testing is something the QA uh, people on our team do. On their own, they uh, use production to verify that the most critical parts of our application are still working, as they should. QA people have a, have a knack for finding out edge cases and finding out weird parts of the system. And so they are in a very good position to do that exploratory testing. And that can lead to other tests or changing existing tests. Monitoring, an oft overlooked but key, key, key part of continuous deployment and continuous testing, because not everything can be caught uh, during a testing run. 
Some errors only occur after a few hours or under extreme load or at certain parts of the day. And our monitoring should be able to catch that, should catch that. Our testing may not. So monitoring is the last step, essentially, in the testing framework. Now, when it comes to testing, good enough is good enough. Um, and with good enough, I mean we deploy to production continuously, so there needs to be some degree of confidence in what we do. Um, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Nothing ever is. Um, and we rely on other tools, uh, maybe even better testing programs or, or feedback forms on the site to inform us when certain parts are not working as well as they should. Good enough also means that we keep the pipeline speed under control. If you keep adding tests and adding tests, pretty soon you're at a pipeline that runs three hours, and at which point you can no longer trust it anymore. So there needs to be a balance, a trade-off between the amount of tests and the time that they take. Running all that together, we can come up with something like this. This is called pipeline as code. This is a, a thing you can do in recent Jenkins installations. And what we say here is that we have four stages. We run our tests, build a Docker image, deploy that image to acceptance, and then to production. The stages are linear or sequential. If one of them were to fail, all the subsequent stages don't execute anymore. The build has failed, right? The build is red. This is Ansible code inside Jenkins code. And, well, the deployment then could look something like this. This is only one way of deploying things. This is what they call a rolling update. There are other uh, ways of deploying. Uh, you have canary releases, uh, blue-green deployments, stuff like that. If you want to talk about that, come see me after. But this is only one example. This is a rolling update. A rolling update in our context means on a machine, we do a Docker pull first to get the new Docker image that we just created in the pipeline. We then start a new container using that image. And we then wait for it to come up. Remember, everything is a service in, in our architecture, so it, every service exposes a port. And we wait for that port to come up. When that port comes up, we run something called the smoke test or the health check. We verify that what we just deployed uh, works, that it responds to our queries in the way that we expect it to. Here, we just invoke a health endpoint, and we expect it to return the 200. If it does, we add that container to our load balancer, which in this case is HA proxy. We add that container to the load balancer, it starts to receive traffic. We then remove one of the old containers from the load balancer, by old I mean from the previous build, the previous generation. We stop that and we remove that. Now generally, if something were to fail here, it would fail here, typically on the first container. The smoke test would fail because uh, the service crashed or uh, it's not booting correctly, whatever. So the smoke test fails, gives a 500, and essentially our pipeline stops. There's not, no harm done because we still have a full amount of replicas from the old build running. So we can still handle all of the traffic that we want. Yes, there is one caveat. If the second deployment fails, then yes, we have replaced one already. But generally, we saw this, when we saw this go wrong, it was on the first deployment of the series. Now, if it all fails, then we want feedback, immediate feedback. Feedback in the form of a build display, such as this, where we can see how long the individual stages take and whether one of the builds is red or green. This is from Jenkins as well. If the build is red, we want to know about it. The siren of shame, which is an LED lamp and a speaker attached to it, and basically the thing starts flashing and making noise whenever a build breaks. This is not to annoy people or blame people. This is to trigger a team to respect their pipeline, respect their build. Because in continuous deployment, we have a pipeline, and that's our lifeline, essentially. That's what we use to deploy stuff to production. We don't do manual deploys anymore. So if the pipeline breaks, that's an immediate priority thing to work on. You can also notify Slack or HipChat or other tools that you have, maybe even text, uh, your phone, whatever, as long as people are notified that the build broke. Very important. Last but not least, results. Initially, um, the team, some of the people on the team, 
had a little bit of trouble accepting um, this whole new way of working, which is not completely unexpected. They've been doing this for quite a long while. Um, and in come a few consultants saying that they can do better. Um, luckily, they found out after, well, not that long amount of time, that this was empowering them to do more. And it was empowering to do so much more that they started repairing the rift between them and the business, which is valuable, which is great. That means that you, that no longer this eh, business people and the business would be eh, developer people, we can never ever get anything delivered. Uh, it's never on time, never works well. Um, it's always eh, and this helps. New technology was a thing. Um, we introduced uh, Elasticsearch and, and other tools that not everybody had as much experience with. Luckily, pair programming helped us a lot um, to transfer that knowledge from person to person. I said uh, that we uh, got into production on Docker 0.6, so we had a few stability issues here and there. Um, we were kind of banking on the speed of Docker development, uh, and luckily we were proven right, otherwise I would have told a very different story today. Um, but uh, we had a few issues, but in general, they were fixed relatively quickly. Pipeline stability, another thing. Um, we had issues with NPM, uh, who hasn't? We had um, issues with all sorts of other tools, uh, network links breaking, stuff like that. Um, that can get annoying sometimes if you, well, some NPM breaking is something you don't always have complete control over. Feature toggle cap, I told you about the feature toggle debt that you need to be aware of. We weren't always completely on the ball there. Business alignment, if you start moving this fast, then the business needs to think of things in this way as well. It's not going to take three months for a feature to be delivered anymore. So if they rely on marketing materials to be ordered, for example, posters or contracts with other suppliers, they need to be far more um, uh, just in time, uh, they don't have three months to get that done. If they put a feature into um, uh, the backlog, then basically half a week or two weeks later it was done. Something like that uh, triggers the business to think about things in a little bit different way. Last but not least, and when it comes to things that didn't go so well, the legacy application is still in production at this point for about 20%, but even then. What went right? Build time per service, under 10 minutes from the very check-in to the last deploy. 50 plus deployments per day. Reduced the number of issues significantly and improved the page load times by a factor of 10 or better. So our page loads all of a sudden were under half a second rather than above five. Improved metrics and audience statistics probably because of that as well. Learning new technology. Very important part when it comes to motivation, but also marketability of developers, usefulness. And at the end, everybody had a lot more confidence in what they were doing, which showed in the velocity that the team had, but in most important, the fun that they had. All right, leaving you with some literature that you uh, might want to read on. Um, Continuous Delivery, The Bible by Jess Farley, uh, Dave Farley and Jess Humble. Building Microservices by Sam Newman. Uh, also includes a chapter on why, when not to build microservices. Build Quality In uh, is a very interesting book by uh, Steve Smith and Matt Skelton, where they detail about 20 uh, projects where they implemented CD and DevOps. All right, I think it's time for questions, is if anybody has one. I'm sure there are a few. Yes, sir. I was hoping somebody would ask that. Database changes in continuous deployment, they don't actually have uh, much to do with continuous deployment, but rather zero downtime deployment. Um, the way um, I would do that is apply the expand contract pattern. And what that means is that uh, if you want to rename a column, for example, in your database table, then rather than renaming the column, we add one with the new name. That's our expand. We then write some code that starts filling that column and then write code that starts reading the column, at which point we can safely delete the old column. So database changes, when you don't want to incur downtime, you can only do backwards compatible changes. So only adding stuff, not deleting or renaming. Well, renaming is a delete, essentially. Right? So that's the only way in my book that that can go, the expand and then contract. So you expand your data, 
and then you use that new data, at which point the old data becomes obsolete, and then you can contract again. You can remove the old code and the old data. Does that answer your question? Awesome. I saw one here, I think. Same question. Same question. Good. Any other questions? In the back there. Good question. So the question is, if you um, uh, add a new service and the service uh, reads or writes from existing data and also writes from new data, how do you keep the stuff in sync? That's pretty much what you ask, right? Yeah, well, um, at some point you have to going to decide who owns the data. So we had a transitional period where, for example, uh, job seeker profiles, the, the uh, code for that writing th that database was still in the old application. And we read from that through uh, through a pipe, essentially. And at some point, so that means that the control over the data was still in the old application, and we were only reading from it, not writing. And then at some point, you reverse that control, and the old application turns to read only. It can never be write and write on both sides, because that would lead to nightmares all across. Um, so it means that you need a little bit more of a um, little bit more of design, probably, or strategy, or thinking about it, maybe a few extra steps. But it can never occur that a service and an old application write to the same database at the same time, because then you're going to, I can guarantee you, inconsistencies. Does that answer the question? What happens if you use a new database? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So the new database is essentially a projection of the old database. Right? So it's a copy and a mapping together of the existing data, but it's not the master data. So if we, we cannot change that projection, well, we could, but that would make it inconsistent, and it would not change the original data. So it's only, it's, it's, it could be a view, or, you know, that, that would translate roughly to what it, what it could be. Um, but you don't want to... Um, uh, directly change the master data in that case. All right, any other questions? Okay, if you do uh, think of another question uh, later on, uh, I'll be here uh, the rest of the day, so please come uh, and see me, uh, or hit me up on Twitter or on me, my email. My blog is there as well. I blog about this thing and about event sourcing and, and other topics as well. Thank you so much for attention, you have a nice day. <laughs>